So uh, thank you for Krakon for inviting me to give this lecture. It's supporting that it's uh, only online, but it's my real pleasure. So as mentioned in the introduction by Dr. Ahmed, I'm <clears throat> the, head of, uh, the head of the Department of Transplantation in my university hospital, where we perform roughly 150 cases per year. And we have quite a lot of uh, antibody limited rejection patients because we transplant patients who are HLA incompatible. So we're going to talk within the next 25 minutes about uh, AB, uh, about antibody limited re rejection. So there are two settings, acute and chronic. So first of all, we're going to focus on acute antibody limited rejection. So one typical case, so this is a 44 year old woman she had a history of uh, uh, chronic kidney failure. This was due to renal dysplasia, and she was on dialysis. She was a mother of three child, and she was never transfused. She was on the kidney waiting list, and she was HLA sensitized against class one and class two genes. And she had the chance to be offered with a deceased kidney transplant in August uh, 2019 without preformed DSA. So there was no preformed DSA. And so there were three mismatches between donor and recipient, A32, DR8, and DR11. You'll see it's very important. And the negative um, LCT cross match was negative, means that it was perfect. She had no DSA, even though she was uh, HLA sensitized, and the cross match was negative. So this is the uh, post-transplant event with regards to creatinine level. So you see she was transplanted on the 25th of August and there was a sharp decrease in serum creatinine and the nadir of serum creatinine was normal at around 100, that is to say 0.9. And by day five, she developed oliguria. And in the subsequent days, she had acute uh, renal failure. And uh, at this point, she improved, and I'm going to tell you why. So she, had, she developed oliguria uh, with acute renal failure. And we performed at day six post transplant a new lymphocytic CT cross match, and it became to be positive. Why was it positive? Because she has developed de novo donor specific alloantibodies against A32. And if you remember, one of the mismatches was A32, okay? It means that she had memory T and B cells were permitted against A32. Why was that? Because the husband was A32, okay? So this was a mischance. And so we performed a kidney biopsy and that biopsy has shown uh, from optic microangiopathy. And we're going to see later on that promotic microangiopathy is a feature of acute antibody mediated rejection. And if we come back, so at this point, we implemented plasma pheresis, daily plasma pheresis, and she recovered. Okay, and you can see on this um, uh, kidney biopsy specimen, you can see the tubules, they were normal almost normal, even though here you've got uh, tubulitis in that tubule, and you've got um, hemorrhage plus um, necrosis of this uh, uh, arterial uh, section, and you've got a lot of uh, infiltrative uh, uh, TB cells, plasma cells within the interstitium, as well as within the uh, peritubular capillaries. Okay, so this was a typical case of acute antibody mediated rejection. And the culprit was that the patient was sensitized against, she, she had been sensitized through pregnancies against her husband, and the husband was HLA32. And by mischance, the uh, donor was also A32, and therefore uh, she had a recall uh, memory B and T cell response against A32. A few words about chronic active antibody mediated rejection, uh, even though the talk is dedicated for uh, acute. So this is a typical case of a young man. He had IgA nephropathy, he was grafted in 2013 with a deceased donor. He had no anti-HL antibodies at transplantation. 
it was a maintenance uh, therapy with TAC plus MMF without steroids because in our center, we do not, we, we stop steroids after a few days or weeks post transplant. And the particularities of this patient were that he had very unstable tacolimus trough levels, and this uh, needed uh, multiple adjustments in order to achieve the uh, targeted trough levels. And so his baseline serum creatinine was around 120 micromole per liter, that is to say about 1.1, and EGFR was 55, it was perfect. And within a year, the sixth year post transplant, he had creeping serum creatinine that reached 190, about 1.75, declining EGFR, and he developed de novo albuminuria. We performed renal echography plus Doppler, it was normal. We assessed a BK virus infection in the blood and the urine, it was negative, and we uh, assessed anti HNA antibodies by Luminex test, and it became positive even though it's in French. So he had no class anti-class one anti-HLA antibodies. Conversely, he developed anti-class two anti-HLA antibodies. And this class two were directed against DR11 and DQ6. And these two antigens were uh, those who were from the donor. And so he developed two DSAs against the donor. And so uh, the kidney biopsy we performed showed uh, double contours, and this explained why he had uh, mild proteinuria. It showed interstitial uh, infiltration, so I2 IFTA, as well as PTC2 and double contours. And so at the end of the day, this patient uh, developed chronic active, active because it was, there was inflammation within the peritubary, uh, capillaries and within the interstitium, uh, chronic uh, antibody mutual rejection, DSA mediated. Okay, so these two uh, uh, case uh, studies uh, uh, are very uh, representative of the setting of antibody mutual rejection. So in the setting of acute rejection, what are the targets? The targets are within the kidneys. Uh, these are the tubular epithelium as well as the endothelium, the glomeruli, and the peritubular capillaries. And indeed, at present, with the current immunosuppressive regimes, uh, the prevalence of cellular re acute rejection is not more than 10 to 15 percent of cases, whereas the prevalence of acute tumoral rejection is very, very low. It's just a few percents. Okay. And indeed, when it comes uh, to know who are the culprits of uh, acute rejection episodes, it's either activated cytotoxic T cells or donor-specific alloantibodies, which result in complement activation. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, uh, humoral rejection it's mediated either in most of the cases by anti-HLA antibodies and sometimes by um, anti-endothelial cell antibodies. And, it's, uh, and the anti-HLA antibodies are mostly present in the setting uh, of previous blood transfusions or previous uh, kidney transplantation or for women in settings of miscarriages or previous pregnancies. And the histology uh, is always the same. There are some vascular lesions, and arthritis, C40 deposits along the vascular walls. And in some cases, we may have hemorrhagic necrosis in the absence of treatment, if we wait too long. And thrombotic microangiopathy like lesions are very, very common, even though the, the patients do not have um, biological evidence for TMA. And finally, these uh, humoral rejections uh, occur or yeah, concur to less than 10% of the overall acute rejection episodes. And indeed, uh, the use of Luminex test is very important in order to detect the uh, DSAs. So DSAs can be detected by microlymphocytotoxicity. It's very uh, specific, but it's not sensitive enough. ELISA test, a bit more uh, sensitive than enough. And finally, at the end of the day, we have to rely on Luminex technology, 
by using either the uh, EMU core or the one lambda platforms. And by Luminex, uh, we are able to detect very low levels of circulating uh, DSAs. And indeed, some of the, the DSAs will bind C1Q or bind, will bind the complement, and others will not bind. And suddenly, this is very important because those uh, DSAs that will bind complements, uh, that is either C1Q binding capacity or C3D binding capacities, are the bad guys in the way that it means that these circulating DSA are able to activate complement and down the road they are able to uh, trigger uh, humoral rejection. Conversely, when uh, the DSAs are not able to bind complement, it's not sure that uh, they are able uh, to uh, result in uh, tissue damages. And we've got C1Q and C3D assays, but they are very expensive. And a surrogate marker for assessing the capacity of the DSA to bind um, complement is to use MFI values driven from the IMU core on one lambda test. And according to the cutoff values at 6,000 greater than 6,000, you can assume that the DSA is able to bind the complement and result in tissue damage. Conversely, when the DSA is lower than 6,000, the likelihood of binding complement is very low, and therefore you might assume that the tissue damage will be very unlikely. And finally, currently we have no drugs that are able to decrease DSAs, which is a pity. Indeed, within, within band classification, uh, humoral rejections, either acute or chronic, are well defined. And for example, for acute active AMR, this relies on three uh, things. Histological evidence for acute tissue injury, evidence of current or recent antibody interaction with the vascular endothelium. It means that C4D deposits alongside the, um, on the you know, tissue kidneys. And also uh, at least moderate microvascular inflammation. This is based on G and PTC uh, scoring. And finally, you need to have surgical evidence for donor-specific alloantibodies. Even though in the last band classification, the requirement for having circulating DSA is not mandatory because we know that we may have uh, anti-endothelial cells who are not detectable by the current test. With regards to chronic active uh, AMR, so we need to have some histological features such as transplant glomerulopathy and inflammation within uh, interstitial um, uh, tubular atrophy, fibrosis. We need to have C4 deposits and we need to have evidence for circulating DSAs. Okay. So with regards to the different patterns that we may encounter for uh, AMR, acute AMR, what are they? So this is uh, the patient uh, that I presented uh, at the very beginning of my talk. So this patient has features of TMA and he has a necrosis of his uh, small vessel within the kidney in addition to having interstitial uh, inflammation plus uh, uh, capillary infiltration. In that patient, you see there is a diffuse hemorrhage within the, the interstitium and it's very severe lesions. You see there is diffuse inflammation here and here, plus this interstitial hemorrhage. This is a very bad prognosis. And when you stain for C4D, you see a very nice pictures of linear staining for C4D deposits alongside the peri uh, articulary. So this is the hallmark of uh, AMR. And as you know, for C4D, it's always positive within the glomeruli. So what counts is not the glomeruli, but it's the uh, peri uh, peritubular capillaries. Recently, the Paris group has uh, uh, reclassified the uh, acute rejections in T cell rejections on the left panel of or antibody mediated rejection on the right panel with or without vasculitis. So this stands for vasculitis 
and we, you may have vasculitis in the setting of T-cell uh, rejection and also in antibody immunity rejection, you may have uh, features of vasculitis. And does it matter? So first of all, when you look at microinflammation, uh, microinflammation is only present in the setting of ABMR. It's not present in the setting of TCA, of uh, T-cell immunity rejection. Transplant glomulopathy is only observed in the setting of ABMR. Conversely, intestinal inflammation is mostly observed in the setting of TCMR, but it might also be observed in the setting of ABMR for those patients who have vasculitis features. In regards to C40 deposition, it's mostly and only observed in the setting of a ABMR. And indeed, anti HLA antibodies are almost only observed in the setting of ABMR. And finally, tubulitis. Tubulitis, it's a hallmark of TCMR, but also might be observed in the setting of ABMR with vasculitis. So you see the, 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 the pattern of ABMR without vasculitis is slightly different from that of ABMR with vasculitis. Because with vasculitis, you've got, you've got a T cell compound, but you don't have with without vasculitis. And does it matter? It's a good question. On the left panel, you see the graph survival according to no rejection, very good graph survival, T cell rejection. The graph survival is still good. Conversely, in the setting of, of ABMR, the graph, the graph survival rate is lower. And when it comes to having or not having vasculitis, it only matters for ABMR. If you have ABMR without vasculitis, the prognosis is not that bad with regards to graft survival. Conversely, if you've got uh, vasculitis plus ABMR, the prognosis is very, very, very bad. And when they uh, look at the uh, predictive factors for uh, graft loss in this cohort of patients, they found that having interstitial inflammation and tubulitis was significantly associated, associated with the poor prognosis, as well as the, the, the high uh, grading score for arthritis. Indeed, having DS, high DSA level was associated with a poor outcome. And finally, according to the type of treatment, uh, for those patients who are treated with steroid, plasmapheresis, IVIG, and rituximab, so that is to say, full house picture for ABMR, they were protected uh, from uh, graft loss. And so this is very important. Okay, so this is another study from the US where they look at the outcome of kidney transplant patients having either acute cellular rejection or ABMR or mixed. And as you can see, when you've got a pure acute cellular rejection, the outcome is very good. Okay, and so uh, if the DSS does appear after or transplantation at the time of acute rejection, the prognosis is worse. And in addition to that, DSS are assessed by MFI, mean presence intensity. If you've got a rap rapid decrease in DSA in uh, MFI intensity, this is associated with a better outcome. Okay, in the setting of acute rejection, if you have de novo DSA, the prognosis is very bad as compared to having no DSA. Okay, so this is another uh, study from the Paris group, including uh, more than 1,400 uh, patients. They had CDC cross match at the time of transplantation, and they have had prospective one year uh, protocol kidney biopsies. And at the same time, they assessed for C40 deposition as well as for a presence or absence of DSA. And there were three groups of patients, those without rejection on the surveillance biopsy at one year, those with subclinical T cell rejection because indeed they were stable, and those with subclinical ABMR. And indeed, uh, microcirculation inflammation was only present in those patients having subclinical ABMR, not in the others. C4 deposits were only present in those with subclinical ABMR. 
transplant glomerulopathy at one year post transplantation was only present in the setting of subclinical AVMR. So this emphasizes the fact that having subclinical AVMR is associated with histological lesions. Conversely, interstitial inflammation to lightness was only present, mostly only present in the setting of subclinical TCMR. Uh, IFTA, IFTA uh, was present across all the three groups, even though it was more important in the setting of subclinical ADMR. And finally, arterial sclerosis was significantly more important in the setting of subclinical ADMR. And at the end of the day, when they look at the estimated GFR, and GFR was very uh, similar to wood station, having, having no uh, evidence for uh, rejection or having subclinical TCMR. Conversely, wood patients having subclinical ABMR had a significantly lower GFR. And this starts very early on. It means that if you were to perform surveillance biopsies, they should occur around the 60 post transplantation, because at this point, uh, uh, it might be helpful. Um, and when uh, they look at uh, the outcome of uh, graft uh, function, according to the GFR at, the, at one year post transplantation, you see that if you are uh, in the best uh, GFR, it doesn't matter whether you have or not a subclinical uh, ABMR. Conversely, if you were to have a lower GFR at one year post transplantation, that is to say lower than 60, having a subclinical ABMR is very important in terms of graft loss. Okay, so what can we do when we have de novo DSAs? Because indeed, uh, to have acute ABMR, you need to have uh, de novo DSAs. So, when you are facing patient with de novo DSA plus ABMR, you have two options. First one, it relies on apheresis for antibody depletion. And this is mandatory because these circulating DSAs do fix the complement and therefore activate complement. This result in uh, tissue damage. And so therefore, at this point, you can invent plasmapheresis or a semi-specific immunoadsorption. Uh, plasmapheresis is not specific, as you know, but it's, uh, it's able to remove IgGs as well as complement factors. Conversely, immunoadsorption uh, is performed using uh, columns that traps uh, IgGs. And so therefore, it only removes IgGs. In addition to removing the antibodies, you need to uh, implement some therapies. And amongst all the therapies we have, you have IVIG, rituximab, ATG, bortezomib, eculizumab, and even those splenectomy. So I will go through the evidence for these therapies. So for acute ABMR, we've got therapies. For chronic AMR, it's not sure that we can do something. So this is a study uh, published 11 years ago uh, showing graft survival in patients having acute ABMR treated with plasmapheresis alone or plasmapheresis alone, sorry, or plasmapheresis plus IVIG. As you can see, if you add IVIG to plasmapheresis, you significantly improve graft survival. So plasmapheresis alone in the setting of ABMR, it's not sufficient. In that study from the Paris group, uh, they uh, included patients that presented with ABMR and the patients were either treated with IVIG alone, this is the first part of the cohort before 2003, or afterwards they were given plasmapheresis, IVIG and rituximab. So it's, you can see on the left panel, uh, you've got the effect of IVIG on the MFIs of DSA. As you can see, IVIG alone has no impact upon uh, MFIs of DSAs. Conversely, if they were given plasmapheresis, IVIG, and rituximab, there was a significant decrease in the MFIs of DSAs. In addition to that, they look at the, the delta uh, MFI uh, after versus before IVIG therapy. And this delta is only minus 30% with IVIG. Conversely, it's minus 80% with 
of plasma pyrolysis, IVIG, and rituximab. And when they examined the long-term results in terms of graft survival, the graft survival was excellent for those patients who were treated with plasma pyrolysis, IVIG, and rituximab, but their it was worse for those who received IVIG alone. So the main message is that when you've got ABMR, IVIG alone are very expensive and not sufficient to um, treat the, uh, the episode. So we conducted in France a few years ago a study whereby uh, the patients experiencing uh, ABMR plus transplant were treated with uh, plasma paresis and in addition to that, either rituximab or placebo. Okay. And the primary endpoint was at day 12 post transplantation, and this was a graft loss or improvement of clinic function lower than 30%. And if this primary endpoint was not achieved, that is to say, if the patient as not an improvement of kidney function um, greater than 30 percent, we were allowed to give a second infusion of rituximab in the rituximab arm or to give de novo rituximab in the uh, placebo arm. So the one year result, so these are the population characteristics of the population baseline. They are very similar in terms of age, time to uh, active injection, uh, as well as serum creatinine at the time of active rejection and the mean MFIs at the time of uh, rejection. So at one year post uh, rejection, graft and patient survival were excellent. Uh, and the primary objective, that is to say, at day 12 post transplantation was similar across the two groups. That is to say, early on post rejection, the addition of rituximab to plasma paralysis was not able to improve renal function. And at one year post transplantation, renal function was very similar. However, when we look at the MFIs of TSAs, um, the diagnosis, it was similar. It was about 6,000. At one month post uh, treatment, it was similar. Conversely, uh, at month three, six, and 12, uh, the MFIs were significantly lower for those patients who were treated with rituximab versus placebo. So for me, the, the message of this trial is that adding rituximab to plasma pheresis in the setting plus steroid pulses in the setting of ABMR is valuable with regards to lowering uh, MFIs. So, okay, so for acute rejection, uh, we've got therapies and these therapies rely on apheresis plus, plus rituximab, I think. IVIG, it's, uh, it's useless. Uh, what about uh, chronic antibody mediated rejection? Just one randomized control trial, because when we face patients having chronic ABMR, what can we do? Apart from increasing the exposure to tacolimus and increasing the exposure to MPA. So this uh, single center study from Vienna included patients having late DSA plus features of acute a chronic ABMR. And they were randomized to receive either bortezomib, as you know, bortezomib is a proteasome inhibitor and might target the plasma cells, or to placebo. And they received two cycles of bortezomib or two cycles of placebo. And the primary endpoint was two years down the road, and the primary endpoint was EGFR slow. Okay, what they found was that the uh, EGFR slope was very similar uh, for uh, placebo and bortezomib groups. You see the decline of GFR was very similar. With regards to death sensor graft survival, patient survival, this was similar. Uh, there was no impact upon DSA levels. You see the DSA MFIs were very similar with placebo and bortezomib. And so it means that in the setting of chronic ABMR, there is no point to use bortezomib. And so the future might rely for uh, treating this chronic ABMR on IL-6 blockade. As you know, IL-6 is a pleiotropic cytokine. It's very efficient in treating a cytokine storm in the setting of COVID-19 infection, but also uh, uh, and, uh, monoclonal antibodies against IL-6 or IL-6 receptors are able to target B cells, T cells, plasma cells, and they might be uh, able to improve the situation of patients having chronic ABMR. So at the end of the day, it's better to prevent 
and prevention relies on good exposure to tacolimus and MPA. So I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or comments, if it's still possible, this will be my pleasure. Uh, a lot of people ask, what is the cut of MFI that we should use in our program here in, in Kenya, where we only do living related transplants. And when we do the DSA, and they tell us that the MFI is, let's say, more than 2,000 or more than 3,000. Uh, what, what should we uh, follow as our cutoff? Yeah, so this is a very important question indeed. You perform only living related kidney transplantation, and so this is a, a gift, a very valuable gift. And so, therefore, you have to protect that kidney. And certainly, the cutoff should be around 3,000. It means that if you've got a DSA below 3,000, you, you need to, to give, to infuse pre-transplant uh, rituximab and to monitor DSA at day 15 and 30 post transplant to, just to be sure to avoid a rebound. But the cutoff should be 3,000. Thank you. And another question is, uh, do you think we should be doing protocol biopsies and routine DSA post-transplant in order to pick up uh, rejection early. Okay, so another important question. So if you are facing with a male patient, first kidney transplant, never transfused, there is no point because unless uh, the, the male is stopping his medications, there is no reason why, almost no reason, sorry, why it would develop de novo DSA. Conversely, if it's a patient who already has had blood transfusions, or if it's a woman that has had uh, pregnancies or miscarriages, I think these patients are at risk of developing de novo DSAs because they have a recalled uh, immune response, uh, B cell, T cell immune response against the uh, uh, previous exposure to H antigens. And indeed, for this cohort of patients, you can perform a surveillance biopsy as we do monthly post transplantation, just to be sure that there is no subclinical TCMR or ABMR. So three months post transplantation, I think it's a good time point. And secondly, uh, in the situation where you may have de novo DSA because of the previous blood transfusions or previous pregnancies, it's worth to perform uh, TSA at one year post transplantation. Why one year? Because the likelihood of developing DSAs before um, one year is quite low. And so if at one year post transplantation you have no DSA, you, can, you are almost on the safe side. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that uh, talk. We really enjoyed it very much.